think I'm supposed to do an introduction now. So if you're ready to go, I'm just going to look at this camera and say some words. I presumed we had already recorded half the podcast right there. <laughs> Are we recording? We're going to use that on the back end. I yeah. hope you use that. <laughs> Welcome to Tip Long Take. We are here joined by uh, director of one of our favorite films, um, big friend of Tiff, and soon to be one. friend of the pod. One of them. <laughs> you one have of, to, you, have you to get guess, to guess what it is. Oh, yeah. God. Mr. Jason Reitman. Jason, <laughs> thanks for coming by in a terrible ice storm. Uh, it's lovely to be here. It's lovely to be inside. Yeah, well, we're, we're going to keep you sheltered, we're going to keep you comfortable, mm -hmm. and uh, we're, we're going to chat about Tully first, your new mm -hmm. film. Um, we've both seen it, we both really, really enjoyed it, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of how that film came about. Yeah, I mean, frankly, it, it's, it's a very short story. I got uh, a phone call from Diablo, and she said, I think I have uh, an idea, and she pitched it to me in a couple lines, I loved it, and six weeks later, there was an email, it was actually on New Year's Eve, I got an email, and it was the script. Mm -hmm. and. She writes in a very pure way. It just kind of comes out of her, and the first draft is the shooting draft. And she writes starting with the first scene and just goes to the end. I was, I was just going to kind of go from Tully, and, and we're going to talk more about that. But looking at your early career, um, as Rob said, we love all of your films, not just one, but... Uh, really all? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I love one, and you get to yeah. figure out which one <laughs> yeah. is. That's what I figured. <laughs> but I'm, I'm wondering, like, early in your career, you, you started in your, in your mid to late 20s. What were kind of the goals that you had at that time in your career? Was it just to make I one mean, movie? Uh, uh, just to get to direct for a living. I mean, that yeah. was the, the first goal. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and I started by directing commercials, and I've directed some really cool ones, and I directed some really awful ones. <laughs> and um, What was the worst commercial that you directed? Um, I directed a, it was both, do you have Outback Steakhouse? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Bloomin' Onions. It's a whole thing. I've directed the Bloomin' Onion. Really? How are they on set? Just so you know. Uh, <laughs> I directed an Outback Steakhouse slash NASCAR commercial. It was both. Oh. And starring two drivers. Right. And that was the least fun thing? It had no script. <laughs> and I was told by the agency, we just want to capture the natural banter of the drivers. So you direct an Outback commercial, and then w what in that commercial made people think, you know what, this guy can direct a whole feature? <laughs> <laughs> it was the opposite. They're like, we like your writing. Yeah. But we saw that Outback spot. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to finance your film. Um, I had written Thank You for Smoking. Someone gave me a copy of the book, Thank You for Smoking, when I was in college, and I fell in love with it. And I, I immediately identified it as, all right, if, if I'm going to be a director, this is exactly the kind of movie I want to make. Mm -hmm. And I made a series of short films, and the short films did progressively better and better. One played mm -hmm. here at TIFF in uh, 2001. And... Uh, by the time I got an agent, he said, you know, what kind of movies do you want to make? And I said, I want to make Thank You for Smoking. That's really mm -hmm. the only movie I want to make. And it started a, a five-year trek of trying to find someone who would actually pay to make it. And oddly, there was nobody in Hollywood who would make it. And one day we got a call from a group of uh, internet billionaires <laughs> who wanted to go in the film business. It seems like a trap. One was named Elon Musk. Oh, okay. One, Wait, actually? Yeah. Wow. One was named Peter Thiel, if you know his yeah. name. Ah, yeah. 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 Uh, guy named uh, David Sachs. Uh, and it was five. I don't know the other two names. Uh, uh, right off the top <laughs> of my right. head. The, first, the they, first two were very good. <laughs> and they had co-created PayPal and recently sold PayPal to eBay for a billion and a half dollars. And they wanted to make movies. And they had read my script, which was at that point more of a writing sample. And they couldn't figure out any reason why... It hadn't been made, and they each wrote a check for a million dollars, and we had a budget of five million dollars, and, mm -hmm. and we got to make the movie. Oh my gosh, amazing! Yeah, that's that's like that seems like a very ideal way to start making a film to an extent, right? Where like you know you're you're working hard, obviously, but then all of a sudden, internet billionaires like come out of nowhere. Were you like shocked and surprised by that as a yeah? As a thing that happened I, I mean, in your life? the strange thing is, I had actually started to write up in the air. Because I couldn't find anyone who wanted to make Thank You for Smoking. So right. I started writing up in the air. Um, and then uh, that got sidetracked uh, mm -hmm. when I got to make Thank You for Smoking. And after Thank You for Smoking, I went back to writing up in the air uh, mm -hmm. when I got the opportunity to make Juno. Mm -hmm. 
So you, you've kind of gone from writing to then adapting someone else's screenplay. Can you tell us about that kind of first connection? Well, adapting have, books. Adapting books, right. Yeah, uh, but, and all of my scripts have been adaptations. Have, a, have been adaptations of books. All your scripts, okay. Yeah, Thank You for Smoking it was an amazing novel. Up in the Air is Walter Kern novels. Mm -hmm. Terrific. What, what attracted you to Diablo and Juno as a script at, like from the beginning? Uh, how did that connection kind of come to be? You know, I had a friend who was lucky enough to get the Juno script like the week it got to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And it was friend, he was friends with the manager, and the manager had discovered Diablo. And I remember just opening the door, and there was a messenger who gave me this envelope, and I opened it, and I just started reading the script, and I realized many pages in that I was still standing in my doorway. Mm -hmm. uh, it just completely caught me. One with its humor, and its dialogue and its language and its inventiveness. But by halfway through the script, what I really fell in love with was her ability to surprise me every time I presumed I knew where that script was going. Every mm -hmm. time I thought I knew who a character was, mm -hmm. they surprised me. And I, I was as invested in the Loring storyline, you know, the, the ba uh, Bateman and Jen Garner, where she pulls this magic trick where you fall in love with you know, Jason Bateman's character mm -hmm. when the movie starts, and you're kind of frustrated with Garner, and then halfway through, she does this switch on you mm -hmm. that is really impressive. I'm, I'm interested in your ability to find lightness in difficult subjects, because mm -hmm. it seems like a thing that you do a lot. Like, you, you, people don't necessarily like, you know, um, cigarette advocates. Um, <laughs> there's all of these things that are like really, really difficult things that you approach with a level of levity and deftness that I think is really, really impressive. And I'm wondering like, what draws you to these subjects and how, how is it that you end up being able to, you know, kind of touch them so lightly? You know, um, I, I wish I had a, a succinct answer about why I like them. I just do. I've always found uh, more humor in them and I, I I've always been attracted to filmmakers who are interested in anti-heroes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, I get bored with the idea of heroizing heroes. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what my job is at that point. Right. Where making a movie about the head lobbyist for Big Tobacco or a pregnant teenager or a guy who fires people for a living mm -hmm. or a woman who's trying to end someone else's marriage. Um, Finding the humanity in those people is really interesting to me. And that journey that I get to go on with the writer and with the actors, trying to find the human being inside and finding the humor inside is really thrilling. Right. In terms of collaborating with a writer like Diablo, how involved is she on the set? Um, do you like to have that collaboration when you're It's interesting. Uh, Diablo and I have a unique relationship in that she almost never comes to set, uh, uh, and and by by complete choice of hers, there's a strange kind of handoff that we have, okay. um, and there's there's this real deep trust. You know, we've now made three movies together. They've happened every five years or so, and you know, Diablo and I we're around the same age. We come from different places, have different upbringings, but for whatever reason, we have this connection, and we're on some sort of similar track, and we're writing this. Uh, kind of diary together mm -hmm. between these films and uh, and I think she trusts that I know what she's saying mm -hmm. and when I read her words I always feel like she's articulating something that I feel but that, that I haven't been able to put into words mm -hmm. is the the choice to make a new film every five years or so um, like is that a, a choice that you've made uh, consciously or is that something that just kind no, of happened it just happened and mm -hmm. and now it's something I'd like to stick to yeah, that's we'll a, see. I mean, we'll see when we get to eighty. You know, uh, <laughs> what kind of movies we're putting out into the world? But um, it's old and slow. Uh, but like, uh, I, I enjoy that trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. And has has the relationship changed over the years? Like, how has that developed over time? We've just changed, but we've changed in a similar way. You know, we we both uh, became parents, and we both became more settled down, and we both had to kind of say goodbye to our childhoods a little, and. Uh, and I, th I think that's a lot of what Tully is about, mm -hmm. is, you know, uh, Juno is really about growing up too fast and young adults about growing up a little too slow. And uh, this is, Tully is a movie about the moment you realize you have to say goodbye to your childhood. And it, it's something about becoming a parent that forces you to reckon with the concept of closing a chapter of your life. Mm -hmm. 
The, there's another collaborator in this film that you've worked with before, and that's uh, Charlize Theron. Mm -hmm. um, what really attracts you to her as an actress and, and the performances she's able to give? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the word that's so commonly associated with her is the first one that always comes to mind, which is her bravery. Mm. And she's brave in that she's completely willing to lock in with these very flawed characters and never give a hint to the audience that she is anyone else but that person. You'll often see comedic performers who are willing to take on a flawed role as long as they can play it arch enough that you know, well, this is clearly a performance. The human being at the center of this is not, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the actor is not who they're playing. Charlize is searching for truth in the most raw form possible. Mm. And she doesn't care uh, how it makes her look physically. She doesn't care how it makes her look emotionally. Uh, our conversations on a daily basis are about how do we make this as real as possible. Mm. As a director, as a male director, directing uh, a female through these like very like female experiences like motherhood, mm -hmm. like the actual birth of a child, mm -hmm. is, is that challenging for you or do you use kind of what's around you to give the direction you need to give on set? I mean, honestly, between Diablo and Charlize and my producer, Helen Astorbrook, yeah. I am surrounded by brilliant women who are perfectly willing to tell me when I have it wrong. Right. right. And how often do you have it wrong? Uh, uh, often. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, and uh, what's great is there's, a, there's an enough trust there on both sides for, you know, uh, any of them to come and tell me, yeah, 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 no, it's not like this. Right. And, and how has having your own kids sort of affected your practice, you know, like on this film, but also as a filmmaker in general, because you, you talked about this film being sort of about kind of letting go of childhood, and mm -hmm. I, I feel like that's got to be a pretty significant, um, you know, impet like a pretty significant impetus, right? Like mm -hmm. to have those children. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I could have made this movie without being a father. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, uh, it, it changes my perspective on everything. Um, it's made me more of an environmentalist. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't really think about the coming generations as much as I did uh, until I thought of my own daughter living in a future. Mm -hmm. And you can think of something in a very theoretical sense, but there's something about the face and the character and the human being that I'm related to that uh, that kind of changes all that. And also, you have to kind of make room for your child to have their own childhood. Mm -hmm. And that you have to be the lame one. Right. <laughs> you have to be the boring, safe one mm -hmm. uh, so that they can be wild and they can be a kid. Mm. Do you look back at some of your older films ever and think about what you would have done differently as you've kind of grown and you've become a parent, you have these responsibilities? Or I mean, it's interesting. In um, I certainly look back at my first couple films and I'm proud of them and yet I go, okay, I know more now. I may have done this, this way or that. Mm -hmm. More so what I feel is, oh, that's who I was. Right. In the same way that you look at an old photo of you and you say, oh, mm -hmm. I used to wear those clothes. <laughs> right. Ha. Huh. <laughs> Interesting choice. Yeah. yeah, wouldn't do it today, uh, but it made sense back then. And I look at choices I made as a storyteller, and it made sense for me. I mean, even look, even making a comedy about the head lobbyist for big tobacco mm. is the kind of fuck you thing you do when you're in mid twenties. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's that's a, <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I, um, I want to talk about casting for a second because mm -hmm. I think that the way that you cast your films um, feels very, very important to their success, right? Like, mm -hmm. people didn't necessarily know who Ellen Page was when it, you cast her in Juno. Like, we knew because we're good Canadians, mm -hmm. but um, that was a big, that was a big and very important role for her. Um, very similar to Michael Sarah. Like, how do you find these people? How do you find the right um, sort of people for the role, and how involved are you in that process? I, I just love movies. Mm -hmm. right. I love movies, and so I had seen Hard Candy, mm -hmm. and I knew who Ellen Page was, and I was an Arrested Development fan, and I knew who Michael Sarah was. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I'd seen Breathe In, so I knew who Mackenzie Davis was. Mm -hmm. um, I. I it, it is no secret. I'm not like out on the street, you know, you know, uh, uh, finding secret actors. Like I, right. I, I just love going to the movies. If I could, I'd go to the movies every single day. And because of that, um, I'm always looking at people and wondering, okay, who could they be? And um, uh, and I get excited about that. It's one of the, the the most important decisions, and one of the most thrilling decisions I make as a director is take this character on the page, and think about. Who who can really embody this? Um, not just in look, but in tone. How do they speak? What's the rhythm of their voice? 
Um, and what kind of chemistry do they have with other human beings? Mm -hmm. And if you pick that, if you get that right, so much of the story starts to tell itself. Mm -hmm. And it starts to move and come to life in front of you. And that's the moment where uh, the movie oddly starts telling you who it is instead of the reverse. Mm -hmm. Have you ever made a choice that you thought was like the perfect casting choice and then been like, well, nope, that was a mistake? Yes. Okay, cool. I can, probably can't ask you who that person no. is, but later I'm going to. Like when, the, when there's no cameras, yeah. we're no, have, but, have this but, but, uh, Yeah, but but absolutely, and and that's one of the challenges. And you look as a director, you're solving problems, and right. that's kind of that's kind of it. And certain things just run themselves, and that's really exciting. Uh, but then, yes. Uh, I've had, uh, I mean, I, I even, I remember on Up in the Air, this is okay, this is a different type of example, but I remember an actress uh, who was just a day player, lovely, great audition, and Clooney just made her nervous. Mm. Well, I get that. And we, had, and we were doing, just doing take after take after take, and she was just, mm. and uh, I remember George, um, George did this thing where he somehow kind of dimmed his own light bulb from mm -hmm. within. Like he brought his movie stardom like down. Like yeah. he just dialed it. It's and, like I'm just gonna take uh, some of my magic away for a moment. Like literally, it uh, it's like, all right, I'll magic down. Uh, <laughs> so we can do this. Oh man. When did you stop getting nervous around celebrities like that? Um, I'm not sure if I was ever nervous around celebrities. There is something that happens in the first few days of any shoot where you get to know how an actor works. Mm -hmm. Because you don't know how much they want to hear before take, how much they want to hear um, between takes, what's their best take. Some people are great on the first take, second take, fifth take, tenth take. Mm -hmm. uh, whether there's someone who's always going to do it the same way is going to be different every time. Mm -hmm. And you start to get these ideas. I was like, oh, take two. Their best take is take two. Mm -hmm. And the first take doesn't even matter. It's awful. It's going to be awful. It's going to be driving all over the road. It's going to be, you know, uh, a garbage fire. But take two is going to be awesome. Um, you, you were speaking earlier about how much you like going to watch films. Like, yeah. how, how often do you watch a film in the cinema? Mm -hmm. And how important is it for you to have your films premiere on a big screen? I'm probably at a movie theater two to three times a week. And I built a home theater in my home, and I'm in there every day. Oh, wow. So I watch a movie in one way or another every day. I just also love being in theaters. I love buying the popcorn and watching the trailers, and the room goes dark. And, mm -hmm. um, and it is important to me that my movies play in theaters. But, but it has nothing to do with the, the size of the screen or the sound, because they never have it loud enough, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, it's the collective experience. Right. Mm -hmm. What I think is exciting about the movie going experience is you have this emotional adventure, whether you're crying or whether you're laughing, and you're doing that with strangers. Mm -hmm. And you're all feeling something collectively for a moment, and it changes. It changes how you experience that. A laugh that you enjoy with other people is way different than a laugh you have alone, and a cry that you have with different people uh, is the same way. So. I want my movies to play for audiences in a theater so that their association with that experience when they think back about it is this weird bit of chemistry that you suddenly have with strangers in a dark room. Mm -hmm. Do you all get nervous at this changing landscape and what streaming services are kind of doing and, and then and films that and the budget you're making them at, um, it's I feel like it's becoming harder and harder to get that theatrical distribution. I mean, um, to be scared of streaming services, I think, is like to be scared of rock and roll. Right. Um, it's, it's changing the way that we enjoy a lot of entertainment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it really serves a deep need for a lot of people who want to consume lots of stories. And that's a good thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have done that. You know, I have this show on, uh, called Casual on Hulu. And, um, uh, and, I, and I tend to do more like that. So uh, and and I and I definitely binge watch a lot of shows. I hope that people still love the theatrical experience as much as I do. Mm -hmm. I hope it doesn't become vaudeville. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's something genuinely special about it. And look, it's up to us filmmakers to make great movies that excite people enough to go see them. Mm -hmm. And I hope that 
audiences are just as excited. I mean, I remember the theater in the night that I saw Pulp Fiction in, and the theater that I, I saw Rushmore in, and the theater in the night I saw Boogie Nights in, mm -hmm. and those are just as important to me as the times that I saw Star Wars. Right. And I lined up for both experiences. So uh, what I hope for is what you just mentioned, that um, people have a need to see Star Wars on a big screen, mm -hmm. but when Quentin or PTA makes a movie, or Damien Chazelle, or whoever is going to come next, mm -hmm. I hope they're lining up for them as well. Right. Uh, besides Tiff Bell Lightbox, favorite theater? Oh, oh, tough. Uh, favorite theater? Um, the Man Village in Los Angeles mm -hmm. is a badass old movie house built in 1927. Uh, had a couple premieres there. Uh, that's an extraordinary theater. Um, <laughs> Oh, man. I mean, I, when I go on vacation, I go to movie theaters. I, on my honeymoon, I went to the movies, I think, two or three times. Yeah. Uh, I, if, I, I remember shooting in this random, very tiny town in Mexico where their movie theater was just a room with a, like, um, you remember those TVs? You're too young. Uh, where <laughs> it, it, it was like a wood box, and the front opened like that and it had three a red a green and a blue lens and they projected on a screen within oh the gosh. wood box i have, have never heard, heard, heard this that is... referred to uh that's <laughs> like, you know what I'm that's a thing about. that exists this was like yeah it's like mitsubishi made them in the 80s <laughs> and they had one of those and a bunch of fold-up chairs Amazing. and for whatever reason the night i was in town if i gave you a million dollars you would never guess the movie <laughs> that was playing that night at what the years theaters. Oh, yeah. well, it wasn't it? current. Okay, <laughs> well, that makes yeah, it a yeah. lot I'm saying, harder. No, it's, no, it's literally about, they were playing Muriel's Wedding. What? Oh, wow. Right. <laughs> like, what? And just like sitting on these folding chairs watching on yes! this TV. Eating popcorn? Uh, I don't remember that detail. <laughs> but that's kind of beautiful though, right? Like mm. everyone's doing that together and enjoying yes. it. Like that's, mm. that's pretty magic. It was really cool. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned that because I'm actually like planning a vacation right now and in my itinerary there is a night where I go see a movie because I'm like, I need, I need right. that in my... And trip. I just love to see how people watch movies around the world. Yeah. 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 Um, we were hoping to kind of end things off with you um, with a bit of a, a casting call. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a new segment. It's probably okay. the only time we'll ever do this. All but right. we really miss your live reads. Okay, okay. And I, we, as we mentioned earlier, we love the way you cast your films. And mm -hmm. we were hoping you could help us recast some classics. Oh, are you, okay. Are you All right. Just All off right. the dome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here yeah. we go. Here we go. Okay. Right. It's exciting. Um, so the first one yeah. we're going to start with is, yeah. I know it's tough, but Jaws. Jaws. Okay. Uh, I mean, it depends on what kind of version of the movie you want, though. Well, it's your version. Yeah. No, but, oh, man. Because, <laughs> like, there's a version where it's like, okay, we want it to be as accurate as possible, like we want, we want, we want the audience to feel exactly what they felt right. in '76 or '77, whenever it was uh, today. Yeah, that's what you want. Let's go with that one. Sure. Yeah. Man. So you got Chief Brody, you got Quint, and you got Hooper. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> I think I go Brian Cranston in the uh, the um, uh, in Chief Brody because mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I believe in his vulnerability. Um, I, you know, he's not as slight as Scheider was, but I think that'll still work. Sorry, I know I'm going really long on this. <laughs> no, uh, that's good. Uh, let's see, in the Dreyfus role, whew, man, you started with a toughie. Um, that's <laughs> they a, got easier. other ones. They that's got a, easier. That's a perfectly cast film, too. I know, uh, we were saying that. He <laughs> uh, needs to be an intellectual, preferably Jewish. Um, what if that's on Ruffalo? Hmm. You know, I'm going to throw a curveball. I'm going to go Seth Rogen. And, Whoa, uh, no Rogen. kidding. Yeah. Uh, legitimately brilliant. Yeah. Jewish. Funny, like Dreyfus was. Yeah. And when he's given the, the chance to be dramatic, he's actually always great. I like that call. Yeah, think of him like in, uh, in the Steve Jobs movie. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. you have that call. All right. All right. Okay, you got Quint, though. You got the captain still. Okay. Idris Elba. Nailed it. Yeah. Okay. okay, I'd watch that. Oh, Hell yeah, you yeah. watch that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm watching it right now. Yeah. <laughs> but what about Thelma and Louise? Oh, great question. All right, Thelma. Thelma and Louise. Uh, okay, Sarandon. Sarandon goes to Charlize. Mm. Nice. It's easy. Uh, Gina Davis. 
Uh, Rosemary DeWitt. Okay, also would see that. Uh, a throw to your dad, twins. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, the, all right, twin, same script, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, clearly The Rock. Yeah. You have, you, there's no other choice. In than the DeVito the role, obviously. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, Dwayne Johnson as, uh, what was his name? I can't remember the character. Julius. Julius, Julius of course. Yeah, we had it written down. Yeah. <laughs> we also said that like in tandem at the same time. That was nice. <laughs> and like, like, how could you? Um, how dare you? All right. Uh, short, uh, yeah, clearly Dwayne Johnson is Julius, and yeah. then DeVito. Vincent. Man. Uh, interesting. Uh, you know, uh, I'll go with the, the 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 popular pick coming off the Oscar. I'll go Sam Rockwell. Oh, I right. like it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. cool. Um, final uh, final film for you to recast. And know that this is one that you like a great deal. Um, yeah. Harold and Maude. Oh man, <laughs> I feel like we're torturing you right now. <laughs> Harold and Maude. Well, I mean, I love this. I mean, so when we do a live read, yeah, yeah. that's the best day. The best day is everyone in the office sits around and goes, all right, you can remake this in a movie with anybody. Who would you put in? And we just start filling it out. And, every, and, and it, one name tops another name. And it's like, oh, could we get maybe? I don't know. But they said, what about, or what if we did it with all women? What if we did it in French? What if we did, you know, you're just coming up with crazy ideas. And um, this is my dream day, too, because like I do this with my friends constantly. So right. Can, like, that that's actually ideal. that's most of our meetings when we should be right. talking about different episodes. We're just recasting. Films. I have a new game for you, by the way. Oh, okay. I have a game that I play with my friends. Yeah. Okay. I think you guys are gonna dig. All right, you have a box. Mm -hmm. It's gonna survive the you know whatever apocalypse happens. There will be human beings after. They'll find the box, and in the box, for any given filmmaker, you can only save three movies of their career. Ooh. So Spielberg, three movies. Everything else gets wiped out. If it doesn't go in the box, no one will ever see it again. So oh. if you go Raiders, Jaws, E.T., no one sees Jurassic Park, no one sees Schindler's, no one sees Classic Encounters, they, they cease to exist. You will, you will talk to somebody like, remember the scene? Like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay. Fincher. Oh, it, 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 I don't everyone. care for this game. This feels painful. Oh, I, love <laughs> I love this game. game. I love this it's game It's amazing. So much. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. oh yeah. basically they, you, you list three names and then you just berate someone for not including uh, a fourth film. <laughs> Have you ever done it for yourself? No, no. <laughs> that would be too hard. No, yeah. but, uh, but, uh, but I love, I, I, I could play that game all day long. I, yeah. uh, I love that game. Cool. Uh, sorry, we were, we were recasting uh, Harold and Maude. Timothy? Both. Like it. And Maud, who is Maud now? God damn! Do you have ideas for this? No, no, I don't have ideas. We added this at the last second. Who plays Maud now? Hold on. Yeah. Let me just silence this phone call. Um, God, I don't know. Who is that actress? I mean, that was a one-of-the-kind mm -hmm. performance. I mean, you know who wants to do it? Who wants to do it? Uh, and I've talked to her, like, multiple times about this. Uh, Sarah Silverman is, like, waiting to be 80 years old so she could play Maude. That, for her, <laughs> is, like, the... That's what she's aiming for in her career. Well, we can wait till then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would direct that. that. I love that idea. We are out of time, but right. big thanks for joining us. It, it was, was a pleasure. fantastic. Awesome. And we are going to play that game that you taught us forever. We're going to berate each other a lot <laughs> in the future because of you. <laughs> Do you guys talk about Pushing Tin a lot on this podcast? Yes. yes. Well, this is, is the Pushing Tin is. official podcast. Welcome to Pushing Tin oh with uh, Robin Jeff. One more surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I um, never let you forget about that movie. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>